So I've already scanned a bunch of the questions for the Kaguya-sama q and I can already tell. This is going to be a, a really fun one, an extra fun one. So let's just get right into the questions. Kayla Grubba asks, whose character did you enjoy the most to see grow? This is a really tough one, considering there are so many great characters that are doing a lot of growing. But my instinct is to go with Ishigami. And I think the reason for that is very early on, while he still has a lot of growth to do in, in coming seasons and just in his life as a, as a person, of course, we got to see him completing at least one arc of his life and development in a very poignant and key way which is reconciling the trauma of his his past, of his younger years, and how that affects his behavior and the way he interacts with other people and the way he carries himself, what he aspires to. His uh, transformation or his growth in that backstory episode to the race, telling that, that poor girl who's sort of a victim in a sense to F off, I can't remember the exact words he used, was so satisfying to see. And I think it's such a great and clear model in the vein of, of Yuki Soma, actually, that is relevant and applicable to real life in a very one-to-one -one way where you don't even realize at first how much who you are and the way you you process things and the very reality with which you, you live in is a function of a model of the world and assumptions you've, you've picked up and made through experience. And it has a way of feeling like absolute reality. Your early experiences create the algorithm through which all other things filter which very directly affects your actions. And you see that so clearly with Ishigami, doubting himself, not wanting to take chances, sort of hating on people who are doing things that he secretly longs to do, but feels like he's unable to because of fear of rejection or, or pain or whatever it is. And in many cases, I don't think it's absolutely essential to do this kind of reflection where you go back to the actual source of the pain and you, you revisit memories and kind of rewrite them. What I think is really valuable and what he ends up doing through that, that process is re-examining the assumptions, recognizing that your thoughts and the way you react to certain things and the way you filter information that comes in is not necessarily absolute truth. It's an interpretation of a truth. And sometimes the best thing you could possibly do is to examine those things and even more powerfully, whether or not you can understand them even, is to rewrite them. Or rather than say it as like a one-time decision, it's more like a habit. It's a building up of thought patterns and action patterns that gives momentum to something else that allows you to build sort of different highways, you know, different mental pathways that become stronger the more you, you visit them. And it's not easy because at first it feels like a lie. You know, it feels like you're walking into a, a death trap, but Ishigami manages to with the support of, you know, some really great people in his life, including Kaguya and notably Miyuki and even people he just met, people in his uh, cheerleading squad, give him just the amount of push he needs to realize that actually he does want these things and it's possible to have these things. And, you know, maybe I actually do deserve these things. Maybe this is possible. And also critically, it is clear to him, it seems, that he recognizes that it's not going to be easy. He, he acknowledges the pain and decides it's worth it to go through the pain. And he ends up doing really cool things. And you just see him living his life, which is just, just so satisfying. It's such a great euphoric moment to see him grab something of life that he's been secretly coveting but has been stopping himself from obtaining. His worst enemy is not the, the demons of his past. It's not that guy, that jerk who was taking secret videos of his girlfriend or the, the girl that Ishigami liked because that's all in the past. It's not the girl who shows up to gloat and rub it in his face. It's not the people who are gossiping about him. Those people exist but the real problem is that he's internalized those voices so that they, they live inside of him and the fact that he's able to start to push back on them and reject them and get out of his own way and then be immediately rewarded for that was such a beautiful thing for me. And it's a long road. You know, it's it's never like you have one moment that just erases everything. He's going to relapse. It's a process, I think, of, you know, two steps forward, one step back always. But I think with a taste of that, just knowing that someone is capable of that kind of makes you confident in their future. Because you're like, okay, they found a vein, you know, they found a vein of processing through difficult things of life. I think one of the biggest, most terrifying traps is just being stuck in that place where you're not able to move at all. And so if he continues to problem solve in the same way, he's going to end up doing some really great things and be largely satisfied with life and be able to overcome the the trauma that he's been carrying deep inside of his physicality and his behavior and his emotions for, you know, years and years and years. I also want to say Kaguya and Miyuki for this answer. I think they've made a long way in, in learning how to act. But as I was talking about a lot during the reaction series, I think there are some fundamental lurking issues that they haven't quite addressed yet, which I suspect will come up in subsequent seasons. Nevertheless, even with what they've done so far, Miyuki and Kaguya have shown a lot of really satisfying growth, especially when you think about Miyuki's growth, not from the start of the show, but from where we see him at the start of his high school career. And the same for Kage as well, you know, I think we sort of come into the story sort of smack in the middle of Miyuki and Kage's awakening. It's not the beginning for them in, in the show. Kieran Thresh asks, who are your top three characters and who do you wish you saw more of? How do you pick in an ensemble like this? To answer the second part first, because that'll tie back into the, the first question, I wish we could see more of Inomiko. She got introduced very late, which explains why there's just less of her, but I think in the show, weirdly, she was one of the characters I was rooting for the most, maybe because she's such this intricate and delicious, 
blend of power and virtue and strength with sweet innocence, which is dangerous for her. And I just feel like I want to protect her, if that makes sense. And there are all these things that are not well harmonized in her that I think just make her character so exciting. You know, like she's very strict with herself and she's very critical of other things, but she has a very, very deep desire to be loved, to be acknowledged for romance herself, to be a great and powerful and competent figure, despite really being a child, you know, to see her apply herself against a world that largely seems against her in certain ways and to see how she continues to manage to bring up the strength largely independently. You know, she's like the self-generating source of ideals and see how far that can go, see how far she could push that is a very exciting proposition for me. After that, for favorite characters, I'm going to say Miyuki. And there probably, unsurprisingly, is some overlap there. You know, he's someone who is at heart a kid. You know, he's a child. He's a young boy in like what is probably the most challenging time of, of his life. And maybe I can relate more to that being being a guy. Remembering how crushing and confusing high school was when navigating romance and dating girls or being attracted to girls who just at that age seemed light years ahead of me. And having his own personal baggage with class and problems at home. You know, his family's great, but it's not the easiest life. He shares a room with his sister, which actually I also relate to. There having been a period where it was just me and my sister and a friend living alone. His father is an interesting dude, but doesn't seem to be the most financially savvy <laughs> or present in a lot of ways. Yet somehow he has this spark that takes all of that energy where it would probably crush most people and turn it into something positive, turn it into something that is good for him and not just good for him, but is giving to people around him. You know, speaking of his sister, he's endlessly giving of K despite the tense tenseness in their relationship. He's always paying attention to other people in the room, most heavily fixated on Kaguya, but still he's always thinking about Ishigami. He's always looking out for people. He's thinking about the, the student body, basically sacrificing himself to the nth degree in order to match his own his own goals, his own expectations of himself, his own desires. So he ends up being this really likable character. It's really easy to root for him while also having this very human touch where he's goofy. You know, he doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, he has great fashion sense, but beyond that, you know, he can't even make a balloon animal. He can't sing. He can't dance. <laughs> he can't play uh, volleyball. But none of that stops him ever. For everything that Miyuki encounters, he ends up treating it like a challenge. And I think that is not an accident. That's directly connected to why he's so successful. He's obviously naturally intelligent, but that's not what gets him to the top. It's his his will, his ability to filter his thinking, his situation into something that is productive and benevolent and kind, you know. As the audience, we get a really great perspective on Miyuki because we get to see him from two two angles. One is just the outperforming everything. I'm going to crush it. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to win Miyuki. And the other is like this aloof, sort of weird, awkward adolescent. And I think that's so cool because Miyuki is the kind of person that you can count on. And he's the kind of person that's going to go on to do amazing things. Not because of his natural gifts, although those are related, but because of his, his outlook, speaking of, you know, algorithms, mental algor algorithms. When you look at someone who's that capable, it feels good to put your trust in them. You know, we want to have people that we can lean on and give us faith in the world. But I think what is often lost in that is that those people are no different a lot of the time. You know, they're no more confident necessarily, and maybe they are, but maybe they're not. Miyuki's just as lost, maybe more lost in some ways than the average teenage high school boy. And we see that very acutely. Yet, he's able to shoulder that burden. There's something really inspiring about that and actually has overlap with other shows on the channel, you know. That's that's the heroic element, even though it's on this, this small local high school scale. And then third character, maybe unsurprisingly, I'm going to say Ishigami again for reasons that I, I mentioned in the first question. Sammy N asks, I know this is a romance anime, but what is your favorite friendship in the show? Oh man, this is really tough to choose. This might be weird to say, but just the top of my head, I'm going to actually say Miyuki Chika. And I think the reason I like that so much is tied to one of the reasons why I like the show so much. And I've mentioned it a bunch, especially in the, the latter couple, couple episodes, but I think one really important choice the show made was giving all the characters their their little foibles, you know, their eccentricities and their their character flaws, let's call them. But it's very clear on the fact that at heart, they're all solid people. And this might be controversial in a, in a response about Chika, because I know she seems to be somewhat of a, a controversial character herself. But what I like about the Chika-Miyuki relationship is they're kind of, not at odds, but they have a very playful, teasing relationship. Chika's not the most sensitive, let's say. She's not the most tactful person when it comes to speaking about others. She just kind of lets it fly and she has a kind of teasing propensity. But even though it's not her natural inclination to help people, she can't help but recognize the greatness in Miyuki and respect his his drive for art, which is, I think, one of the best aspects of her character. You know, that, that soul that she has for music and the arts and pursuits of that nature. So she ends up taking on this mother role in certain contexts for, for Miyuki. And not only that, not only helps him to grow, but is delighted for him when he succeeds. It's a great choice for Miyuki as well, because that's sort of when we get those those primary moments of vulnerability and, you know, flailing around like a helpless kid that I was mentioning. 
as well as his ability to conquer challenges and grow as an individual. And the fact that they experience that together is something really special. I, it's weird to say, but it is a mentor-people relationship in a sense. It's just a very odd mentor. And my feeling about it is that Chica also gets a lot out of it. I think that's part of her subtle character growth is service to Miyuki, perhaps. There's a there's a very endearing quality to that whole relationship. And also, those skits happen to be some of the most compelling, in my opinion. And some of the most fun. You know, the the famous rap, rap battle, rap episode is just, it's gold. Even though that was not so much of her being a mentor. I think that those episodes sort of set the stage for that. I think one of my favorite moments of the show, actually, is her breaking down in tears when Miyuki is singing the, the school anthem. That is a key moment simultaneously for both her and Miyuki, I think. But I couldn't end this question without also mentioning Kaguya and Ishigami's relationship. Maybe for similar reasons. I think that Kaguya needs that too. You know, there's a there's a question for Kaguya about what are her motivations. And in her own mind, she's just this selfish person who is just looking to get things out of other people. And I think you could look at each of those moments and argue that there's something she might get out of the Ishigami relationship that's, that's selfish. But I think my interpretation of it is that it's more than that. I think that she actually is addressing something that she sees as a need for Ishigami. And there's gen- genuine regard there, even if she doesn't recognize it herself completely. My sense of it is that she can't help but at least subconsciously have added him to her inner circle. He's gotten close enough without her even knowing, you know, he's penetrated her defenses, maybe just through proximity, where something is activated in her that makes her care for him almost despite herself, it seems. I mean, some of it might just be a cold recognition of a flaw that she can see. I think actually everyone can probably see it about Ishigami, except for him, or he has a certain deeper, different, darker conception of it. Whereas they realize, you know, you could just do this if you got over some of your, your stuff. And because she's wired for greatness and wired for high achievement, she's able to sort of give him that, that image through experience. I think one of my favorite examples of their interactions is when she challenges him to get high grades. She gives him a motivation, first of all, which is great, and then correctly recognizes that he's not happy with his results, even though he's he's acting cavalier about it. And then is like, remember this feeling, you know, this is the feeling that you need to take to carry with you so that you do better next time. That was a huge gift that she gave him. You know, basically, I think the, the dynamics in the show do a great job having the different characters complement each other, each of them caring for their others in their immediate environment and giving them the gift of something that they have in spades. And so as a result, they all end up pulling each other up. And as for which friendship I want to see more in the future, I'm going to give a weird answer and say, I'm really intrigued by the Nagisa and Maki relationship. What the hell is going on with that relationship? It's so bizarre. The last couple episodes created a really weird atmosphere for that whole threesome. Starting to think there's a lot more to that beneath the surface. I also think the show does such a great job planting seeds really early that you don't really understand the full context of until later. And I think that in hindsight, later on, if we get the full story on them, going back and watching the first couple seasons, it's it's going to look different. It's going to look very different. Athena asks, what was your favorite gag, running gag in the show? I think probably Kawai So, because it's so, it's so terrifying. And like, I understand that the feeling, the fear of that, the, you know, the teenage imagination running wild of how terrible everything will go and how bad it'll look. And maybe it's, it's a stroke of genius. I don't know if it was intentional is Kaguya starts to go down that road with Miyuki when he actually confesses with the balloons, but it actually doesn't matter. Like Miyuki does get the Kawai So in a sense, like, oh, you could have just told me in a simpler way. This is so silly or childish or whatever, but it, it means nothing. The words are not important because she's not this cardboard imaginary cutout. She's a human being with thoughts and feelings and deep desires herself. And so in a sense, he got her reaction right, but wrong. And isn't that how it, it goes? Like, yeah, everything you fear probably has a, an element of truth to it, which is part of the trick. It's part of the disguise of those kinds of dark ruminations, but it's not as severe. It's not as life or death as it feels when you're imagining it. Also notable as comments point out is that was a lie. That was great. You know, Miko misunderstanding everything. Miyuki being incompetent, incapable. Chika being a cheater, I think is hilarious. Ishigami's sad walks through the hallway early on. There's just a lot of great ones. Very sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, but Talawaz asks, what are your thoughts on how the story progressed and evolved past the premise? Absolutely essential. So it's such a great premise. It creates all these opportunities for a very relatable and emotionally intense phenomenon that I think everyone understands on some level with emotional resonance, with comedy. But I think that it was essential to move beyond that. Now, it's a little bit tough because we only got three seasons. We may only get three seasons. I hear there's a movie coming out. But I think it becomes clear to the audience pretty early on that it can't only be that. You know, if you do something that is kind of sitcom-esque, where at the end of every episode, everything has to go back to normal to be able to keep the the skit format, it ran the risk of, of not going deep enough. And so I think what I like about the show is they substitute that, especially as the show progresses, with character growth along other veins. I think there's actually not a whole lot of progress romantically for the duration of the show, but still you get these poignant character examinations and growth of of character. I think that's part of the reason why that that Ishigami episode is so revered. I think that was one of the the biggest examples early on of like 
wow, there's actually been massive transformation that occurred. And I think one of the reasons why season three is so dynamic, it feels in, in many ways more dynamic than other seasons, is that becomes more of a primary focus. And I really, really hope the series continues because I actually think where it left off would be of huge benefit to the show. Like, I want to see what happens next now that those restrictions have been removed somewhat. The love is war, we're never actually moving anywhere in terms of our relationship, is both a blessing and a curse. You know, it's a, it's a blessing because it's allowing of a real examination of that state, like we go really deep into that, has huge potential for comedy, obviously, is hilarious, but towards the negative, deprives the plot somewhat of advancement. So the show was fun from season one, episode one, but I think it's in season three when it starts to actually make moves and start to address the premise a little bit more and ultimately give kind of closure to that intro premise to a large degree that it gets really gripping. So I want to pick up there and keep going and I hope that we actually end up getting that. Goldie 8 asks, what did you think of the evolution of the Kaguya Ishigami relationship over time? As I mentioned, this is one of my favorite elements in the show. It's so critical for Ishigami, I think also very importantly, it's something we need for Kaguya. We needed at certain points to see that because we have the same questions that she has, I think. Kaguya, despite being the heroine, has questionable character to some degree. It's the same questions that she herself has. Beneath the, the veneer, beneath the status and all, all her ability and the fact that she seems to be so successful and is so revered in society, what is at her heart? What is the, her actual character that would make her someone, someone that we want to root for, someone that we fall in love with? And it's extra important for the audience to get those glimpses of her. Early on, there are a couple of moments where you can start to see it. You know, when she does the, the walk alone to school, I think that was a really pivotal turning point for me and thinking about her. The finale of season one, where you kind of get a, a glimpse of the fact that she's just a sweet girl who wants to be loved and doesn't know how to do anything about that. She doesn't think she can expect it. She's just sort of bearing life in the hopes that maybe one day, you know, something will happen for her. But I think the Ishigami relationship is so key because it gives it that that one-to-one -one human touch where, no, actually she's caring about other people. She's going out on a limb also for sort of a pariah, you know, a social pariah. Ishigami is not well-respected, well-liked. He's seen as a creep and Kage is someone of high status. Her rejecting the the girls in the library when they are like, why would you hang out with someone like this? Such a defining moment for, for her character, I think. So critical. The status is sort of neither here nor there, I think, for most people, especially in a character study, watching as the audience. That's less transferable to me, I think. I'm speaking for myself, but I think most people are probably the same. That What, what we're really looking for is ways to connect at, at a human level and, and find someone likable in terms of who they are at heart. So this relationship is essential for the both of them for different reasons, and especially for Kage in, in the audience's conception of her. Contrast that even with the fact that Chika is quote unquote her her best friend but she detests her or at least we see a lot of moments of disgust with her and I know that that might seem like it's warranted because Chika is a, a controversial character and it's maybe not the kindest but nevertheless there's a darkness to that whole vein of thought where somebody can quickly become your mortal enemy because they're a threat to something that you desire Blood Mist asks how are you going to restrain yourself from reading ahead and finishing the manga I'll be honest I actually am really tempted I think what is stopping me is that I just generally don't read manga and also the fact that I'm doing Kaguya for YouTube and Patreon, so in instances where I identify something as being channel connected, I feel the need to find a way to make it reactable, and the manga is much harder to do that. You know, I did the, the Kyoshi books, the Kyoshi novels a while back, and I did some of the av Avatar comics, and that was a lot of fun, but video formats is a lot easier to do, so I would rather keep that door open and just have hope that we will get more of the show in video form so that I can continue the series. Divya Joshi asks, what was your favorite opening and ending? It is that time again. It is that time of the Q&A where I go back and rewatch all of them. <laughs> but before I even watch, I'm going to say off the top of my head that the the last ending, hard to top. I don't know about musically. I don't think there's any musical piece from the openings or endings that really like made a huge impression on me in the way that other, other openings and endings have. I'm going to give it full points just for for the concept, the visuals, the fact that it tells a full story that's related to the theme is Starship Troopers and the Kaguya myth and really nicely encapsulates the whole Miyuki struggle in kind of a fanfic of itself. It's it's really great. It's really well done. This one's hard to top, top as the opening. It's just because it's the first, I feel like it has a special place in my heart. This probably has been clear through, you know, things I've said along the way. But one thing that's made the show extra poignant for me is I've been in a very dramatic relationship. An extremely dramatic... <laughs> relationship while filming this show and the concept of love and war is so so relevant to me the the whole idea of deep love being connected with the risk of great pain and you know openness versus sort of game playing in fact going back to what i was saying about story progression one of the things i want to see the most is what happens next because that's sort of the domain that i've been living at you know the the after this the there's the first obsession the feeling of impossibility of it of getting together which was my experience in this situation and knowing how 
sweet that can be. You know, there's a few things like that feeling in my, in my experience. But then realizing that's not the end, that's actually the beginning. It's funny reading comments on, on this opening video. An anime with likable characters, rarely any fan service. <laughs> Someone didn't see the OVA. They're not wrong though. Generally, there isn't that much. Oh, but Daddy Daddy Do! How could I forget Daddy Daddy Do? Ooh, tough, tough. I guess I didn't realize how much I actually liked these these openings. I guess I was secretly jamming out to them without even being aware. Yeah, I'm gonna stick with that. I'm gonna go with the season one opening, even though Daddy Daddy Do is a lot of fun. And season three ending. Backslash asks, what do you predict will happen and what do you want to happen for the other characters? So this actually is connected to what I was just saying. Where the story ends at season three is just the beginning of the actual struggle. It's also just the beginning of their character development. They've overcome a lot. You know, they've overcome their inhibitions. They've overcome some of their personal fear. The time pressure helped them sort of accelerate their actions to a point where they were able to confess in a, in a meaningful way. But what's so exciting is that there are a lot of issues for both both of them that not only haven't gotten addressed, but probably will become exacerbated by the relationship, in my opinion. One thing that's come up a lot for me watching the series is how a lot of struggles that seem external and seem circumstance-based are largely internal struggles. And we fixate on the external struggles so much because they end up being a mirror for what we are and what we need to address, but can't see directly in ourselves. So Miyuki is a mirror for Kaguya because he's able to live his life in sort of this free way and, and meet the world and have faith in others and love in others and be generous and be benevolent where she feels incapable of doing that but the solution for her lies not in Miyuki himself he's just a sign of those things he's just a, a evidence that those things exist in her heart both as a desire and right now a, a lack you know a certain kind of inability but the fact that she can even see that the fact that that's ruminating in her mind means that is something that is of her now it's something that is budding of her and so that has to be an area of, of focus for her and Miyuki will will be great for her in that way just as being that thing to aspire to something to see objectively so that she can comprehend it. But there's no substitute for her actually getting there herself and practicing that. And she still has all of the obstacles and all of the burdens that she had from the beginning. I know she can do it. She doesn't know that she can do it fully. She hasn't practiced it. She's still very terrified of the world. She lives in this oppressive environment. She, up until recently, didn't really believe that life could be good, you know? And Miyuki as well. You know, this may have missed the point somewhat when I said this in the finale, but I definitely think there's an element of truth to it. Miyuki has issues of self-value, and he has them in a in a sort of superficial way. He doesn't see himself as worthy. He has a weird value hierarchy, value judgment of what, what valuable means. We know intuitively watching that it's not Kaguya's status. Miyuki doesn't know that. Miyuki's environment is one where he's an outcast and he's struggled really hard to make a world for himself in, in that life. But in the sense, he's also fed the game. You know, he's fed that model of thinking where he has to prove himself. He has to answer for his own background. You know, he has to provide something of value to fill the, the gap he feels in his own value from his status, from his family family background. And Kaguya will not ever be a solution for that. It might be in the eyes of others, but that's always going to be a hollow and superficial victory. He'll get that and it won't solve the problem. He'll quickly realize. Going back to the very beginning of this, this video, it all comes back to one's own internal model and algorithm with which you process the world. And in his, he is low and this is what value means. And he, he'll never have it. He'll never have that unless he addresses those fundamental assumptions. And sadly, these things will end up, if left unchecked, as self-fulfilling prophecies. They're going to create the things they most fear. This is not a prediction for the way the show will go necessarily, because I think the show will sort of demand them to, to grow, but I will make a prediction for them as real people in real life since they already feel so 3D. And that is for Kaguya, she's so wired, she's so ready to think that she's not worthy of Miyuki, that she's a terrible person, that anything that goes wrong in their relationship, anything Miyuki does that can be misconstrued, especially given her propensity for misunderstanding, is going to be internalized by her as something she's deficient in. I think our brains are always trying to assign meaning to things. We're always trying to interpret events as relevant to our, our current schema. Unfortunately, one effect of that is an event will happen that is probably the result of a lot of different things and is very complex and is full of intangibles. However, events need to fill into a pre-made slot where we can conceive it. And so it'll fit really neatly into a fear because that's already there and that's deeply ingrained and that's a lot easier and more digestible immediately than the truth of things, which is infinitely complex and hard to fully understand. And so anything that goes wrong with Miyuki has the potential to deeply wound Kaguya, especially because she's just made this huge leap and opened her heart and taken the risk chosen to believe, chosen to get closer to the her fellow hedgehog, leaving her neck open to be ripped apart. You know, that's exactly how she's going to interpret that. She's going to retreat farther into her abyss as soon as things start to go wrong, if left unchecked and if other people around her don't 
give her that support. And if she doesn't have a key realization of the way she's been structuring things until now. Miyuki also is going to come up against people who don't accept him. And it might not even be for his background. There might be a host of other reasons. I mean, Kaguya's father seems very protective. And I don't know, we don't we don't see him, which I think is a really great and interesting choice. We don't know how he'll feel about Miyuki. We do know he's going to be very protective of Kaguya. And Miyuki will almost certainly take that as rejection based on social status, whether or not that plays a part. He's always going to be fighting this, this perceived demon out there without realizing that the demon is in himself. It's in, in the way he has assigned value to things. The only thing that I think will save them is the fact that they're both capable of reflection, especially Miyuki. I sort of have more faith in Miyuki than I have in Kaguya in a key way, because Miyuki is sort of the problem solver and Kaguya is sort of the person who retreats. And for both of them, the fact that they interpret things that way means they will react in a way that creates the same thing. You know, if Kaguya misunderstands Miyuki, for example, and lashes out at him, Miyuki, at first at least, might not be able to recognize what's going on. And he will take that as a personal attack. And he might also develop pain. He might grow more distant, which is going to feed the cycle of Kaguya feeling rejected. So there's a huge danger there. I think that's actually the danger that a lot of a lot of couples experience where it's compounded misunderstandings based on each person's respective lens. For Miyuki, if he sees himself as unworthy of Kaguya for too long, he's going to become bitter and resentful and act out and, and be unconfident and insecure, which will reinforce the idea to other people and to himself that he actually is not worthy. The things that Miyuki brings to a relationship and to the world is his ability to do things and be competent and be strong and be giving. But if he allows himself to be undermined by self-doubt, that is going to be weakened. And so he actually will be of less value, if that makes sense, just not in the way he was conceptualizing it. And this is actually super relevant to me because when I was first dating my current girlfriend, when I saw her, when I met her, she was someone who I assigned a certain status to that I didn't think I had any hope of being with. But to make a long story short, dating her has not conferred with me any of those things. It actually has just become something to lose because if I hadn't addressed some of the underlying things that led to that kind of doubt or led to that feeling of, of unworthiness, there's always that imbalance of power in my own mind where at any moment she'll figure that out. You know, she'll realize that, oh, I'm actually not someone who deserves her and then it's gone. It becomes a point of fear which undermines the, the growth. I think the solution and the, the point of benefit in all this lies in being conscious of that. You know, what is it about the situation for me or for Kaguya or for Miyuki that triggered a feeling of lack? And then how do I address that? And as I mentioned in other videos, I think there's only two things I've come to. One is you either have to try to be more objective in the assessment of how important really is. A lot of times these are based on really old demons, you know, things that were created young and were never really re-examined. It's sort of like thinking about a word for the first time, you know, it's a word you've been using your whole life and suddenly you look at the word and think this word is bizarre. Why is it spelled like this or, or whatever? It's like experiencing it for the first time. Or you recognize that actually this would be of something valuable. Maybe not of soul value, but of tool value. You know, maybe I could aspire to this not as an extension of self, but just as a challenge that will enrich my life and, you know, have a healthy detachment from it in that way while also pursuing it and go for that and make that happen. That would be a benefit for a lot of reasons. It's it's taking on a challenge or responsibility. It's being self-honest about what you actually want. And if all things go well, it actually might improve your life circumstantially. The danger, of course, being you don't want to make things of superficial value of higher priority than things of actual deep personal soul value. I mean, for me, meeting my girlfriend for the first time, spending that initial time with her, there was something about her that I felt was off limits for me that I couldn't hope to have in my life. But the solution there is not her, you know? I mean, I think it's actually my responsibility to her as a human being that I care about to not have that be my motivation, to strip that away as much as possible in a process of sort of narrowing down and identifying what exactly that thing is and where does my responsibility begin. And th that is sort of a, a larger thing just for life in general and dealing with issues, you know? It's that classic thing of give me the, the strength or I don't remember the quote exactly, but help me to recognize the things I can't change, the things I can change and the ability to know the difference. That's really it. You know, it's like you can't control the world. There's a lot of things that are out of your control. It's not a matter of taking responsibility for everything because it's not you. The challenge lies in recognizing where your responsibility begins. What are the things that are about you and are of your own agency? And then reducing problems to the level of that agency where, oh, this is where my responsibility begins. This is where I begin and where just randomness ends. And okay, well, then I've identified this area where I would like to perform better or I would like to overcome this challenge and just articulating it in that way first and then problem solving and practicing, whether it's practicing thought or practicing behavior and probably both in tandem. I think about the things that weigh on me, the things that give me anxiety or cause negative sentiments to emerge. And first I have to resist the urge to self-blame or see it as a problem that is just perpetual to my very being because it's not, right? There's nothing that is perpetual to my being that I can't find something workable for at least. These overarching judgments are not real. You know, they're just a way of oversimplifying to conceptualize one's role in the world. But then, you know, rejecting, rejecting that, identifying, well, is this a thing that is actually valuable to me? Or is this a fear of like not being accepted for not having this thing? 
is this an external value that I've inherited without questioning? Looking at it that way, I think is, is really helpful because it might result in an insight that, well, this isn't even me. You know, I'm just living up to someone else's standard that I never set, set for myself. You know, actually, I value these things in myself and am worried that I won't be accepted. Okay, well, that's fine. You know, you've gone a long way then in accepting it. But, you know, more often than not, I think what, what actually will emerge is, yeah, I actually could be doing better in this way. And it's not even in terms of results. I think that's a mistake because you can't control results necessarily. It's more a concept of, yeah, I haven't been meeting my own expectations in this regard. This is a chronic problem that I'm allowing to exist. And so it's okay, well, how could I solve this problem? And already you've you've taken sort of some agency back from the universe. It's like, okay, this is now something in my power. Can I do it? That's tough. Where am I going to get the strength from? Maybe the strength and motivation can come from being tired of it weighing on you, you know, being tired of feeling that way or just as good, at least, how great would it feel to overcome this challenge? Be the person I want to be first and just have faith that that actually might lead to the results I want. And I think once that clicks, it's hard to go back. You know, it's one of those things you can't unsee. And that's a pretty good model in general for just approaching things, I think. And so that's the process for me, thinking that if I do things right, it's actually going to be things I have control over. It's going to be things that make me more structurally sound, whatever the case may be in the relationship, however things turn out, you know, to gain insight from this and sort of add that to my roster so that I'm forever benefited rather than being at the whim of all of my fears and societal circumstance and beauty or whatever the case may be. That also is the case for Kaguya and, and Miyuki. It has to become a personal journey that happens in tandem with their, their couple journey. The former can never be a substitute for the latter. It's similar in concept to teacher pupil. You know, a good teacher will guide a student and, you know, give them shortcuts and reflect what they need to work on. But the work has to happen at the student level. And <laughs> this is a very long answer, but so that's sort of what I want to happen. I want it to become an individual journey where they become better as people, they grow, and for that to have the effect of deepening their relationship. I'm a very firm believer that one of the best ways to give to others is to be strong yourself, be the link in the chain that everyone can rely on. And then from there to your capability without need and, and desire for reciprocity, actually be in the position to give something of, of value. And the cool thing is both can be pursued simultaneously. You know, Miyuki can be a great boyfriend for Kaguya while becoming stronger day by day as he's, he reflects and grows. But that's just the main couple. I think to make this very general, I want all of them to continue on the path of growth. I think that's broad enough that it, it could apply to everyone, even if it's not in a relationship. It's the process of abstracting based on one's issues, one's problems and challenges, identifying the way that it can be taken responsibility of for answering that, that call and becoming really robust in that key way so that they can become better participants in the world and be more giving to others. David Joshi asks, thoughts on Kaguya's character? I think I spent a lot of time being terrified for her. And it's all things I've said before in this video, but I would say that she's the person that I'm most concerned for, that I think has the, the biggest risk. A key moment for me in thinking about her was the, the hospital scene where she's in bed and Miyuki visits her and you see the, the before and after. You know, right before he shows up, she's just an absolute mess. She's sliding all the way into her own darkness. Nothing matters. Nothing is worth living. And then he shows up and boom, everything is great. I love my life. That is a, a great moment and a relatable moment and it gives you good feelings, but it also hides a, a massive danger and it goes back to exactly what I was just saying, where that is unhealthy to a certain degree. Miyuki cannot be the band-aid for her own personal issues. It will never work. It will f all fall apart. Add to that the fact that she has a natural thing where she becomes very bitter and hateful and resentful of people who threaten it, which makes sense given that it's it's so scarce for her. She lives in this world of scarcity of positive emotion and feeling and love and warmth. But that, I think, if unchecked in real life, there's a cliff looming for her where she falls all the way off and it's like, yeah, life is just about manipulation. It's all about power. If I don't control people and manipulate them, I will never get what I want. That's a hard thing to retrace. And that is part of the relief of these, you know, moments of warmth for her character. And especially for the, the end of season three, where she's able to dive in. She's able to put that game aside and just be vulnerable and just experience life and is rewarded for that. That's a light in the darkness. Or oh, maybe this is the turning point for her. The Great Quack asks general thoughts on Chica. I'm so glad this came up. Okay. So disclaimer, I recognize, or I have been led to believe that I might not have the full picture on Chica from the show when compared to the manga. I believe that there's more development on her motivations and things like that in that, but I'm just going to approach this question from what I know, what I've seen, which is the, the anime up to this point only, and say that I actually like Chica a lot. She doesn't have the same growth other characters have, but I wouldn't be so quick to say that's a negative thing. And in fact, I think a lot of her, her negative traits, I see more as innocence than malevolence or just not having had enough experience and that actually is fine. Personally, I believe that Chica is a good person at heart and here's my evidence for that. When 
people call on her, when people count on her, she shows up. Miyuki is a great example of this. Chika initially taunts him. She is very disparaging of him verbally, but she goes out of her way to help him and very critically is moved to the point of tears when he's successful. That to me is where it counts. I don't really care so much about the, the jab she takes at people. I actually think that's a reflection of the fact that this might be controversial. She's very emotionally healthy. I, I said it partly facetiously that she has everything she needs and she is who she needs to be already. But I, I think there's a vein of truth to that. I think just whatever happened in her life, however, however she developed through a combination of circumstance and her nat natural disposition, she's just kind of enjoying life. You know, she's happy go lucky. And that's a gift. You know, like she doesn't necessarily need to have these big, the big moments of character growth. If she's doing well, if she's fully engaged in her life and is enjoying her time in the student council and in school and has no fears for the future, which she probably doesn't need to have because she's well set up for life from her family and also is very talented and smart, even though even if she's not like the top of the student list, it's an elite school, right? She doesn't need to have that those worries. She doesn't need to have that growth. She might be something like a flat art character. But back to why she says disparaging things. As I've said before, I think a lot of niceness that we experience in life is not actual niceness. I think a lot of it is conformity because people do not have the freedom to be whatever they are naturally. They understand there are consequences to certain behavior and certain things. So they sort of hem themselves in and their true personality is revealed in moments where they feel like there will be no repercussions, which sadly a lot of the time means the way people lash out at those closest to them. Chica on the outside is very cold, but for me, it's refreshing and is a good sign in a sense because you kind of know who Chica is, at least from the anime. She has no filter. So, okay, she's poking at people. She'll take these jabs at people and she'll make fun of them. But it's almost sort of meaningless banter to me. It's just, she's sort of like a, what do you call it? She's trolling for her own amusement. But when push comes to shove, she's there for you. I'll take that. You know, I'll take that person and have fun with someone like that over someone who's like super polite and super nice, but I can't count on. Like take Nagisa, for example. Nagisa is very like outwardly kind and stuff, but she's got a whole bizarre thing underneath the surface there. I have friends like this. And actually, I feel like there's an element of this in me where I like to stir things up. I like to see people's reactions. I think teasing can be fun. It's the heart that's important to me. I have friends who are really hard on me in different ways. Some are just, you know, very critical or will tell me how they think about my behavior. Some of them like to make fun of me. We have, you know, banter or whatever, but I know in their heart, they are there for me. And I'll, I'll take that any day of the week. Think about Kaguya, especially early Kaguya when, when it compares to Chika. I don't actually know what Chika thinks about Kaguya, but I can't think of a situation where she wasn't supportive. I think Chika has sort of an ignorance of the way what she says hits people. Because she's not living in this world of ex extreme emotional fluctuations, she's kind of solid. She doesn't understand the lows they have. And so she may be insensitive, but it's sort of not her responsibility. When I say she's free, what I mean is she is riding her own wave no matter where people are. And I don't think, to my recollection, it ever crosses a line where it's irredeemable cruelty, you know, where it's cruelty for the sake of bringing someone down. It's a more playful sort of evil where it's like, let's just poke at this for fun. There are people who don't really exhibit feelings of extreme depth of character, depth of experience, and that's fine. You know, that's just sort of where they are. She might not have been able to develop the empathy without having gone through similar experiences or having that, that depth of pain. And so she just exists on this level of fun. And I just like watching her for that reason. You know, what's the point? You know, what's the point of those developments for her if she's already where she wants to be. So Chica's capricious. She's a troublemaker. She definitely has some childish elements. The cheating thing. Her competitive nature. She lives in kind of a fantasy. But I believe, however misguidedly, on an inner sweetness that you can count on. Then add to that the fact that she has tremendous depth in certain key areas, especially in regards to art. You know, she's talented too. Narratively speaking, I think she is essential to the cast of people who are growing as sort of this reliable flat character who's just always who she is. This is a really weird example because it was mostly a, a comedic sketch, but I think the ramen episode with Chica was key. Think about the kings of ramen, right? It, it just means so much to them. They have all of their identity wrapped up in this thing and, and they're thinking about it to a super deep level. And then in walks Chica who doesn't give a crap, right? And the thinking for them is, well, this girl, this simple girl can never understand ramen, but that's not the case. She may not have that same intricacy of thought and emotional experience that the king of ramen has, but it doesn't matter because her enjoyment of ramen is at a similar height as his. So that I think actually is a metaphor for Chica as a whole. She just lives at that layer where she doesn't need to have all of that. She just is, you know, she's not better or worse than the, the king of ramen in her ramen experience. She just got there in a less volatile fashion. She just showed up and enjoys ramen. And then consider the fact that she has no idea what's going on in that episode. She can't connect with that at all. 
she's oblivious. She's like, well, who is this weird guy? That's Chica in a nutshell. She just can't go into other people's experiences because she doesn't have them. Also, will Ishigami become a harem protagonist? I'm reasonably convinced that Tsubame is warm up for him. I think, and this is going to be no surprise, that where this is going is a relationship with him and Inomiko. Blue Buddy asks, what do you think about Ishigami's character development? So I've already talked a lot about Ishigami, but there's one thing I want to add about him. I actually, at first, was a little bit disappointed by the accidental Tsubame confession because I think it would have been much more powerful and satisfying if he had overcome that and willingly done it. But then I realized that that is not off the table yet. This might be leading the way for a bigger confession of that very nature with Inomiko. That is what I really want to see from Ishigami. Blood Mist asks, did you French kiss the first time you kissed a girl? I don't remember, but I, I'm pretty sure, depending on what you mean by first kiss, because, you know, there's like kid stuff. Pretty sure I did. And I think it's sort of weird. I think I alluded to this. I kind of regret how much I was influenced by culture in terms of thinking about sexual behavior. I think there was a desire to be more adult than I needed to be. LRMC32 asks, top three skits segments from a comedic standpoint. That's tough. But immediately coming to mind is the rap, the rap episode. Just absolutely amazing. Blue ass, just legendary, iconic. Oh, I want to add to this question from before. The running gag, one of my favorite running gags is Miyuki's embarrassment after every grand gesture because that is so relatable. I think Chika and Kaguya's sexual innocence skit with, you know, the first time and I do it with my 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 dog, you know, that was, that was cute. I actually think one of the funniest parts of the show was the OVA just because of how deeply they went into it and simultaneously made it a fan service episode while also maintaining a certain level of, of self-awareness about it. Oh, the, the shoujo, shoujo, is that right? The really dramatic sort of fanfic after credit scene was great, really funny. This is not necessarily a skit, but another running thing is Miyuki's fashion choices. <laughs> I love and never moved on from the oxytocin episode. There's a lot. There's so many to name. I'm sure like a million are going to come to me later. Also, do you still think the story can maintain the initial romance-fueled mind games? Or is it best to move on? I think it can keep all of the stuff that made the show great while moving on. I think that the confession happening is the best thing that could have happened for the show. Because there's no shortage of material from here on out. There's no shortage of character exploration. But now we actually can get something like a, a progressing plot. We can get something more focused on them as individuals, more focused on their growth, more direct interaction in, in a poignant way. And I really don't think that it has to sacrifice anything. You know, I don't think it has to sacrifice the humor. The humor doesn't come exclusively from the premise. It comes from the writing. It comes from the dynamics between the characters. And that's still all there. In fact, I think what is the backbone of the story that makes it exciting is really the character writing. So as long as they have these characters, as long as the writing stays consistent, removing the, the initial I can't confess premise is a freeing thing, not an inhibiting thing. I think that it was a really great tool to get us hooked, to give us something we can sink our teeth in and immediately understand as everyone who's been an adolescent understands it to some level probably. Get us intrigued by it enough to get invested in the characters. But once we've got invested in the characters, that's all that matters. The rest can be dispensed with. It was an on-ramp, you know. John asks, when watching animes based in Japan, there can be striking cultural differences. When it comes to Kaguya, what aspects of the show that you could chalk up to being cultural differences do you have the hardest time wrapping your head around? And since you have dated girls from different countries, have you had to overcome any cultural barriers in regards to romance? Have I ever? So first, I have a great story about this actually from today. This is such good timing. One of the things that I always joke about is the fact that is the student council really that big of a deal? Is this really life? It is. As a lot of you guys know, I live in Korea currently. I spent a lot of time in Korea. I used to teach English in Korea. I have a lot of friends still teaching English in Korea. I was talking to a good friend of mine this morning who's a teacher at an elite high school who told me that there's a, a student in school that is a problem. Like a lot of teachers have an issue with the kid and their estimation is that it's not so much the kid but the mother. To hear the story told from him, the mother is very active and very vocal about her expectations for what happens to her son, is seemingly quick to blame teachers for things that go wrong when responding to feedback about her son's behavior, has a difficult time attributing those things to her son and would rather attribute them to school management or faculty or whatever the case may be. And being a, a foreign teacher in Korea is a complex thing because you're dealing with students in a language that's not native to them and then by definition have to interact with their parents, but there's a language barrier there. So there's, o there's always an intermediary in the form of a Korean um, co-teacher, they call it, who it's, it's a tough position because they take the brunt of parents feedback and have to be polite and respectful even though they're not always involved in the conflict. They're an emotional damage buffer for foreign teachers. It, it works out. It's not the intention but that's the way it, it falls on them. And so my friend has a problem with the student and he did something egregious in class and the school decided that he had to write a letter of apology but he wrote his letter of apology in Korean and when my friend got it translated from his co-teacher it was basically talking about how terrible my friend was and how one day he will bow to the kid 
included in profuse apology or, or whatever the case may be. And when the school brought that up to them, the mother defended the kid and it seems that the mother had a hand in writing it even. I say all this to set a context for the kid. This kid also happens to be the class president. He got this position through basically being being edgy, it seems. I think he sang a comedic song during his candidacy speech and got elected, but doesn't take the role seriously at all. Enter a, a female student who is apparently like everyone's favorite student. Everyone knows her. She's great. She's amazing. She has top grades. Great character. This girl took an interest in student politics and stood up in, in class when it was time to reelect and made a case that we should be taking life more seriously in Ino Miko type fashion. And she, she said that she would be running for the role. And she ended up winning. She got voted in. And then this is where the story gets crazy. The boy's mother is suing for this. She's suing for what the girl said about her son. Even worse is the school in response to this panicked and put pressure on this girl to resign, which she did and issued a public apology in class in which she bowed. When the girl's parents found out about this, they decided to counter sue. So we have this ongoing lawsuit over the results and what was said in the election running up to a student council election. So that just answers all my questions. Is this really a big deal? It turns out it is a big deal. It is a huge deal, which leads me to believe that everything else about anime I've seen is real and that Japan is just uh, full of roving middle school girl gangs. That story aside, another thing is I think that in Asia, grades are more associated with coolness than they are in the West. I think we, we tend to associate getting really good grades with conformity, which is not super connected to the, the Western spirit of individuality, making your own way, being unique, standing out. It's tough for me to talk about Japan because I've, I haven't lived there that extensively. I've had more experience with Korea, but I'm kind of just guessing that there's similar things. There's, there's a little bit of overlap. And, you know, I have to make the disclaimer of something that I actually think is confused somewhat for discrimination when it's, it's really not. It's just kind of a fact. You hear that foreigners live in Japan for a long time and they feel somewhat put off by the fact that they'll never be seen as Japanese. The same thing is true in Korea, but I don't think it's discrimination. I, I think it's it's kind of just the truth. The cultural structures and rules are pretty layered and deep. And I think it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to have a full lived understanding of what that means coming to the country later because there's a big part of it that has to do with hierarchy and structure coming up in the world going from young to old especially in school and in the workplace people arriving in asia can kind of like jump into a pleasant territory where they can take advantage of the the greatness of the culture without having had to do the work and also being given a lot of leeway for being outsiders you know it worked i think it works to your advantage a lot in korea because people are impressed with kind of any level of korean ability and generally like the feeling that people are interested in their culture without making the same very strict social demands that people who live here have to adhere to. It's sort of, you're given the understanding that, oh, you're, you know, you're a foreigner. And yeah, it would certainly feel nice to feel accepted. But I think that I get that acceptance without people seeing that I'm Korean. You know, people see me for what I am, which is someone who comes to Korea with a positive regard for Korea, wanting to learn the language and the culture. And why should I be seen as anything different? That's exactly what I am. I say all that to say, while I will never fully understand the depths of it, and this is just my impression of it, it seems to me that social, financial, and educational status play a bigger role in some of these Asian countries. Like all of these things, it's going to be a matter of degree, you know, because everyone, every country is aware of that scale on some level. I say that to say, I think the priority on education makes a little more sense in that context because it's going to define your, your status to a larger degree. It's going to be a larger predictor of your success in financial terms, but also in romantic terms, likely. From what I understand, talking to people, if you were not born into a certain status, if you're not born into a certain class of wealth, for example, the only way to raise your status is through education, you know, by going to Seoul National University or even better going to an American Ivy League. So I think that explains some of that priority. Why school is such an integral part of, of life. About cultural barriers in dating, I think it's important to point out that people in all cultures are probably something like 99% the same. It's just that the things that are the same are as unrecognizable to us as water is to fish. It's just sort of the basic structure and what we notice is the differences. So things end up feeling different and certainly there are a lot of differences, but just to set the, the context, those are things that exist at the margin and probably are a matter of degree rather than kind. So to list some examples of things that are a little bit different here, speaking specifically of Korea, I would say while sexual behavior is probably more same than people realize, I think image is very different. I think people in the West are a lot more open and maybe proud of their sexuality. Like I've been seeing clips of street interviews where people ask about people's body count. Like you, you wouldn't ask that in Korea and you definitely wouldn't say that, which doesn't mean people don't have a high body count. It just means you have to kind 
kind of be conscious of the image that you are projecting. I don't want to make this cynical. And I also want to state that this is a very specific world that I live in. I'm, I'm not like dating all of Korea. I'm specifically dating a subgroup of that, which is Korean people who are open to dating foreigners, which is important to keep in mind. But without going into specifics, I'll say I've seen a lot of image covering. I think there's a, a very big difference in behavior between public and private, whereas I think that is more aligned for better or worse in the West. This is a weird story, but I had a girl refuse to hug me because she was embarrassed what the taxi driver would think. But I mean, that should have been the least of her worries. Also, a little interesting thing about Korean relationships, it seems more celebratory of milestones. So for example, you know, in the West, we celebrate the one year anniversary, but Korea counts the days. So like 100 days is a big event. 200 days is a big event. 300 days is a big event. There's a lot of events to prepare for if you're a boyfriend. Couple clothing is big. People wear matching t-shirts and shoes and things like that, matching outfits as like a, a sign of, of relationship. I mean, honestly, this is my life. I've never said this, I don't think openly, but my relationship is very challenging in this way in the sense that my girlfriend is over 10 years younger than me, doesn't speak English and is from a different culture. So my life is navigating these differences. So have I had to overcome cultural barriers? Absolutely. Cultural and age and language. It really is dating on hard mode. Another thing is, in my experience, all of your female friends get cut off. I think that's something people are a little bit more open to in the West. I even know people who are in relationships yet continue to talk to their ex on a platonic level. Hopefully that's not for everyone and it's going to be controversial, but it exists to some degree. Whereas I think in Korea, that's that's a big deal breaker. Connected to something I mentioned earlier, I think there's a little more emphasis on people's finance. Though to put that in a positive light, I don't think it's as much of a deal breaker. Like I don't think it means that people will be disqualified for not being financially well off. But I do think it has enhanced power as a benefit. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want to make it sound like Korean people are shallow and vain and are just like money chasers. The people I met are all looking for the same thing anyone's looking for. You know, it's a good connection, feeling loved, having fun. But I think that social status, financial status will, will probably go a longer way because that security is more meaningful here. Since I think it's harder to move socially by oneself than it is in the West. And then this might be controversial and it's not my intention at all. It's just my experience and there's no judgment here at all. It's just something I've perceived. One way I've experienced cultural barriers in regards to romance is not with women, it's with men. And I don't mean dating men. I mean, there's a little bit of a love-hate relationship, especially in the nightlife scene, I'd say, like going out, that you experience. I think that you meet a certain type of guy out as a foreigner where people are under the impression that Korean girls really want to date foreign guys. And that is not true by law or by propensity. I think you pick a random Korean person and they're they're probably going to express a desire to date someone Korean. The reason for that misconception is that there's a supply and demand imbalance. So let's say like 1% of the Korean population wants to date a foreigner. Well, there just aren't that many foreigners here. So that 1% outweighs the number of foreigners so that each foreign person has a higher chance of finding someone to date. So to an observer, you see foreigners, you see them successful in, in relationships. It's not the same thing as they can get anyone they want, right? Or they're like top of the heap. It's just that they can easily find some kind of connection, but that gets confused. So in nightlife settings, and this is not just my experience, this is conversations I've had endlessly with other foreign guys here. There are some Korean guys who will want to befriend you in the hopes that that will boost their chances of meeting girls. And it's completely backwards because think about it logically. If there are girls that are going to be interested in me, that's not going to transfer to them. It never would. It doesn't work any better than like bringing your most handsome friend to the bar thinking that girls are going to like trickle down to you. It's a totally bizarre and off base concept from the get go. But this can turn into bitterness a lot of the time. It turns into bitterness when things don't go that way for them or and go that way for you, perhaps. I've had some really bad incidences where, for example, I hit it off with a girl. This is a long time ago. And a guy started to physically, I won't say assault her, but he was just being way too aggressive and crossing key lines physically, trying to restrain her and like remove her from the situation against her will. There's a lot of propensity for tension in that regard. There's a little bit of a competitiveness that, that forms. And again, this is very specific to the nightlife scene. I think people who are trying to pick up girls, they will see a girl with a foreigner as an opportunity to come in and sort of circumvent you with language. So I've had moments of conflict where like I understand what's going on and I have to kind of like be a little bit defensive, which is a really tough situation to be in because I, I don't want that. Like I'm not going out looking for trouble, looking for conflict. I'm just trying to have fun. But I also don't want to just, you know, resign myself to someone kind of moving in on someone I like. So to be honest, there's been some really bad moments that arose from that. Now that I have a girlfriend, I just don't even put myself in that situation because it can get really tense. I actually had that experience in Japan, come to think of it. I was only in Osaka for like three days and it happened to me. Same friend actually as the, the student council story I just told. We went to Japan together and we met two girls at a, at a club and one of, and like suddenly um, there were Japanese guys scolding the girls saying that you don't want to like be associated with foreigners, do you? And I had enough Japanese to understand what was going on and it, and it was successful. They actually like just 
Stole our girls. <laughs> you want a visceral animal experience as a man? Hard to top that. Megan Tulliver asks, how many times have you watched the Chica Dance? I put it as an end screen, so not counting that. Just watching it, pure watching it. Maybe between five and, and ten times. It's pretty good. It's pretty fun. I like it a lot. What do you expect to happen in the future with Ishigami, Tsubame, and Miko? I've alluded to this already, but I think things go well with Tsubame, but I don't think there's that, that flame there for either of them. I think that she's sort of like this goddess status, and they might be able to form a relationship. They might not. I see them developing in a, in a good way, one way or the other, even as friends maybe. But they don't seem like naturally aligned. You know, going way back to what what is the purpose of relationships, what is a good relationship, I think one of the, the ways that it goes really well, besides just general fun and rapport, is growth and learning and recognizing things in the other people that are mirrors for things we want to be and ways we want to improve. And Tsubame has that for Ishigami, for sure. You know, everyone has something we can learn from, especially great people like Tsubame. You know, she literally is great. But Ishigami and Miko seem to have more of that like magnet where they're kind of on complementary levels of that spectrum. But I think it will take a while. Putting this in real life terms and not show's terms, what I would anticipate happening in real life is Miko Ino would start dating someone because she wants to. You can tell she's craving some sort of romantic affection and that will awaken Ishigami's feelings. He'll realize sort of too late. That I think is a really common thing where the desire you have for someone, the interest you have in someone is only brought to the surface by by jealousy, by realizing you, you may have missed your window, by putting yourself in someone else's shoes. What happens? from there? I don't know. It could be really interesting. Compare Fruits Basket and Kaguya-sama. Do you prefer one to the other? It feels wrong to say this in the Kaguya-sama Q&A, but if I had to only choose one to watch, I would choose Fruits Basket because I think that the things I like about just shows in general in Kaguya-sama is the character exploration in depth, and I think that Fruits Basket is a more unfiltered experience in, in that way. The comedy is so great and refreshing in Kaguya, and I would never replace that, but being a selfish person who's looking at shows to just take selfishly. First Basket is just like power punch after power punch after power punch. And I think um, the depth of each of them is comparable at their high points. But First Basket as a whole is so complete in that way. So dedicated to that. To give Kaguya a fighting chance though, I will say that it's probably not fair to compare since Kaguya is not done. I think that we're just sort of starting to accelerate in that regard. There's a lot of skip chapters that didn't make it to the anime. Would you consider going back and reading them? I'm open to it, but as I said before in the question about manga, it's not my highest priority, I'm sort of satisfied with what the show picks and chooses to focus on. I think it would be a lot of fun, especially if they were handpicked. Like, for example, people used to do this for me with AOT, like I was watching Attack on Titan, and people would send me the, the manga panels of things that added key key background information that the anime skipped. That was great. I'm not sure I would make a concentrated effort, is what I'm saying. Music Asam asks, what growth are you still hoping to see from each of the characters? Who do you think will take more of a spotlight? So Kaguya, as I mentioned, is not out of the woods. There's still a, a large, looming darkness for her character. It's not even related to Miyuki. You know, Miyuki was the catalyst for her desire and her getting out of a lot of her, her state or wanting to get out of her state. But amazingly enough, even obtaining Miyuki as a boyfriend is a great victory for her, but is not a solution to a lot of those lingering problems. It's not a solution for her self-worth. It's not a solution for her family problems and their expectations, her father's uh, oppressive nature, the expectations placed on her versus what she really is and what she wants for herself. Kaguya has a long, exciting road ahead of her. And I think the most satisfying way for that to take fruit is for for her to become fully Kaguya and figure out who she is and then like strip away at those fears one by one and choose to be who she is. As for who is going to take more of a spotlight, I think that Miyuki and Kaguya can still take the biggest part of the spotlight. In fact, I think that's more justified now that they're together because it's a new chapter. It's new dilemmas that will come up as being part of a relationship. A relationship is even more fraught with the perils of misunderstanding perhaps than, you know, the pre-dating stage. But I hope to see more of Miko Ino. I hope to see more of Ishigami. I just hope for Chika that she doesn't get relegated to playing the the world's worst detective. Deval Goblin asks, what did you expect from the show when you were watching through season one? So pretty quickly, I expected it to be more lighthearted than it ended up being. I think it does a great job establishing certain moments of depth that give me the hint, like, oh, there's more coming. One thing about season one that I think makes it pale in comparison to season two and three is that it's just pretty much all Kage and Miyuki all the time. I think the show benefited greatly from expanding the cast, and I didn't expect that. Speaking of Fruits Basket, JLGG asks, which president had more growth thanks to the relationship with the other student council members, Yuki Soma or Miyuki Shirogane? I would say similar, especially if we don't take Miyuki to the show, but take Miyuki as we saw him in the flashback when he first started, compared to where he is now. I think one parallel of both of them is it starts out as an exploration of self and then quickly becomes an exploration of other people, which actually is largely what they need. To give some credit to Yuki, it seems, or at least has been established this way, as being more contrary to his base stats. Miyuki always seems like sort of a go-getter and has a reasonable degree of people skills, whereas Yuki just does not and is forced to overcome that. But points from Miyuki, even though a lot of these skits are, are comedic focus, 
focused. Some of the high points for me in that development was very one-to-one -one in the Chika Miyuki skits, not to keep harping on that. And as for which couple, 100% Kage and Miyuki, I actually think that Machi Yuki is one of the weaker elements of the Fruit Basket couple couplings. Justice Hastings asked, was there anything in particular you thought the series was lacking? It had it all. It's a great blend of everything. As I mentioned, I think that it was a little bit hemmed in by its premise, at least, you know, as far as what I'm typically looking for. Jonathan David asks, did you think you would or wouldn't see a confession? You mentioned a feeling of fatigue and burnout from a lack of progress, and I sort of get that. I hoped for a confession, but I, I didn't expect it. I was not sure up until the very moment of if they would confess to each other or not, but I'm really glad they did. I think it was essential. Yeah, my only real regret in response to a bunch of these questions is that it ended there. I want to live in that now. You know, I want to live in this new state. Havatel asks, what was your favorite dramatic moment? I think it would be, I'll mention a few. The ending for sure, the, the actual confession was amazing and beautiful. Ishigami's episode, uh, Miyuki pushing him to run and him running, him overcoming his demons that way in a way that affected his, his life and allowed him to take action and believe in himself. And Chika crying when Miyuki performed well at the, the student assembly. Oh, and I'll add to that, uh, Shirogani encouraging you know Miko to speak during the student council elections. Okabebe asks, who has the best trip? Miyuki, with, without a doubt. He just looks so stylish all the time. He's willing to take risks, you know? I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what Kei says or what Chika says or what Kaguya may say about his fashion. I think he looks great and I think he, he does a great job. Steve asks, how did you fall under Chika's spell in the beginning and what freed you from her clutches? So I've talked about this already, but I don't think I was ever freed from her clutches. I think I, at the end, was unimpressed by her detective abilities and kind of wanted her to play a more more meaningful role because maybe I'm totally deluded, but I see goodness in Chika. I think the growth that she needs to do is not really anything about her inner composition. It's more of just experience and a maturity. She just conducts herself like a little girl, but I don't think there's anything really deeply troublesome about it, as I've mentioned. Anvik asks, in a show where kids have so much agency, adults become redundant. What are your thoughts on major adult characters and why do we have them? That's a really great point. Well, just to talk about Shirogani's father, he plays this cool dual role of being a, a source of issues. Looking at that household, you realize that Shirogani is fighting a difficult battle. He's, in a way, he and I guess his sister to some degree as well are kind of taking care of themselves, but he has just enough guidance that you still kind of root for him. He's a very interesting character that I think gives some context into Miyuki and Kei's life, as well as possibly being a potential point of growth. Perhaps one thing the adults do is they give an outside reference on the kid characters. They stop in now and then to check up on the kids and you realize that, oh yeah, they're, they're, they're kids. And they have parent issues, you know, lest you forget. Actually, I think one really great touch is having the most powerful, most prominent, most significant adult figure be absent, and that's Kaguya's father. Kaguya his father is a huge part of the show. He's always lurking. We see his, you know, him written on the walls, basically. So without ever having seen him, he's a full character. I thought that was so cool. Arrakis asks, given that this was a rom-com, do you think it fits your established mood and way you do review, reaction, and analysis? Yeah, I think that even though in terms of the response, the view response on YouTube, this was kind of a, you know, a lighter show. I am so grateful to be able to do these shows. I think I need to do these shows. I think that the most impactful shows for me have been the grandiose, the heroic. But what's so great about shows like, you know, Fruits Basket, although that show is also really grand, and Kaguya is that even though there is overlap thematically in terms of, you know, meeting your expectations and becoming a better person, etc., it delivers it in a manner that's more relatable, you know, it's more day-to-day -day experience. So there are things that come up from that that I, I would never get to talk about otherwise that I think are really interesting to me. I think also the reason I initially watched Fruits Basket in the first place was because I was looking for something romantic. I was looking for something about love. I think at that time I was entering into a relationship because it was such a big, all-consuming part of my mind and my composition and my focus that I felt way wasteful to not be doing something that was reflecting that in some way. So Fruits Basket and this also by extension gave me that outlet that's been really good for me and I think has helped me conceptualize my relationship and my responsibility in my relationship in ways that have been really useful. It's like they fed each other. You know, my relationship fed the show and the show fed my relationship. I mean, for me, there's no guideline. There's no limit on the kind of show I want to do or watch. The only thing that I need there to be is some kind of thing that's relatable and feels true. And nobody, no genre has a monopoly on that. And I think to that extent, the show hits those moments pretty often. I mean, even the comedic elements are <laughs> relatable, you know, it's simultaneously funny and painful. You just want to you want to hide under the under the table. Lewis asks, a canon Kaguya Sama movie was announced. What do you think it will be about? What do you think they will explore? So I've mentioned that this is really the beginning of the story. This is where the real depth is, the relationship. It's not the prelude to the relationship. They've now taken the leap. You know, they've exposed themselves to the hedgehog spines. This is where it gets really dangerous and exciting. One thing I haven't mentioned in this video is it would be so cool if it's actually in college and in Stanford. How amazing would it be to see Kaguya Sama's take on America. <laughs> 
Donnie Betlam asks, do you have a favorite confession you've made? How would you have confessed if you were Miyuki or Kage's shoes? I'll tell you two that are both embarrassing and one worked out and one didn't. In high school, there was a girl I had a super crush on and I didn't have any classes with her, but she had a class right next to mine at a certain time. And so like I agonized about it for weeks and weeks. Like I need to talk to her. I need to get her attention somehow because I'm never going to run into her naturally. So then one day in between classes, you know, there, there's like the pandemonium of everyone moving around the school and I caught up to her. Maybe it was creepy. I don't know. And I said, oh, excuse me. Sorry. Like I just wanted to introduce myself. And I can't remember exactly how it went, but she told me her name, even though I already knew, of course. And then she asked me my name and I said, my name is Alex. And then for some inexplicable reason, I said, but you can call me Al. <laughs> uh, Hertz is talking about this. No one has ever called me Al. I've never wanted to be referred to as Al. I have no idea why I said that. And you know, she took it well enough. She she was polite enough. She didn't think anything of it. She's like, okay, nice to meet you. And then moved on. I never spoke to her again. What makes this extra terrible for me is in college, my best friend ended up dating a girl whose best friend, wouldn't you know it, turned out to be that girl. So she came back into my life and that story became relevant again. And for a long time, everyone referred to me as Al. <laughs> and I like was never able to live that down. Even that's not that bad. You know, it felt a lot worse then than it does now. It's sort of a harmless story in hindsight, but just the, the embarrassment. It, why? Why did I do that? I guess I still feel, feel it a little bit. And then fast forward to the present day. I met this girl in the summer of 2021 in New York. I was planning on going to Korea a couple months from that point, but I met a girl who was visiting New York from Korea and we went on three dates and I just was immediately smitten and uh, changed my plan to not only come to Korea a month earlier without a visa, which meant I had to do quarantine because that was a thing at the time, but also to fly without a plan to Jeju, which is the island that she lives on in Korea, just in the vague hope that we could make something work. You know, we kept in touch and it was friendly and it definitely seemed like there was a little bit of potential there, but I really had no guarantee. And I, you know, I did it. I booked a ticket. I went through two weeks of agonizing quarantine, just thinking about her every day. I finally got out and spent one day in Seoul only and just booked it right to Jeju. Arrived and sent her a text and just no response, no response at all. And so I just gave up. I'm like, okay, well, I guess it was just a missed, missed opportunity. Nothing to, nothing to lose. But then finally she got in touch with me and she's like, hey, I'm about to walk my dog. I got up really late today. Do you want to go for a walk with me? So I met her and we took her dog to the park and uh, I just couldn't contain myself. I was kind of a, a bundle of energy and emotion. So I just told her like, look, I, you know, I, I'm really, I really like you. And I've been thinking about you nonstop since we met, you know, blah, 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 blah. It was a confession, a clear confession. And she was sort of like, okay. And then just kind of silent. So I'm like, well, what, what do you think? She's like, well, we don't really know each other that well. <laughs> and, oh, and oh man, that hit me like a ton of bricks, but you know, she was right. And that girl's not my girlfriend. So it all worked out. But yeah, that was a, a moment where you, you realize that your emotions, the depth of your feelings are just that they don't indicate any kind of larger reality. And you just have to sort of understand that and be patient. But I think in hindsight, since we started dating, that story ends up having a romantic tint. You know, the fact that I, I did that on a whim with no guarantee and the relationship worked out. That was my my kind of confession, I guess. Geneva the Weeba asks, would you ever consider doing a dub clips reaction like the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood bloopers? Definitely. Definitely. That sounds like a lot of Fun. I can't promise just because there's so many things to do, but if you want, if you have the time, send them to me and I will try to check them out. Sammy asks, who's better at messing with Kaguya, Chika or Hayasaka? I'm going to say Hayasaka because I think Hayasaka is more deliberate. Chika might be deliberate to some extent. I think on some level she knows what she's doing and is messing around. But I think that part of Chika's behavior and the things that make Kaguya jealous are just her lack of inhibitions, getting close with people and having fun with people and, you know, playing the stupid game of life or whatever. Hayasaka knows what hurts Kaguya and intentionally tries to cut deep. Like there's a moment where Kagi is making all this progress and she's she's finally showing signs of strength and she's learned this like mother's touch technique and is okay with Miyuki doing things and then Hayasaka just drags her back down. It's like, well, don't you know that in these situations people hook up, you know? This is total extrapolation and I don't think this is established by the show. It's just like a potential thing for people. I think sometimes even people who are trying to help, they have a weird incentive to not want you to grow because they are attached to that identity as a helper, you know? And if you think your value, your utility comes from being support for someone else, that is a strike against you wanting them to be independent because then what is your function in the relationship? Hayasaka might have an element of that, you know, where she's there for Kaguya and I believe she's a good friend, but she also might see being there for Kaguya as a central part of her identity. And so Kaguya's growth might be a threat, you know, it might seem like something that will end up leaving her behind. And half Eldian Mahan asks, what's your top three favorite episodes? The finale, the Ishigami track episode with his growth, tough number three. So I'm going to list a couple. Season one's finale. Season two 
finale also has a special place in my heart. The rap episode, just for just the glory of that episode. Chica teaching Miyuki how to sing. And Iko Mino's introductory episodes. I actually think, is there an episode where Ino Miko is heavily featured? Plus, we get that Ishigami grades episode where he's striving to get good grades. I can't remember exactly. One of the things that makes it tough to identify favorite episodes is that I don't remember them as solid episodes. I remember them as discrete skits. And I can't remember necessarily which episode had the collection of skits that were the best. So yeah, that's going to do it for the Kaguya-sama Love is War Q&A. It's a really great ride. I sincerely hope we get more than just the movie. Like, I really feel like you can do infinite, not infinite, you can do a lot of seasons of this. It doesn't have to just be the intro to the relationship. The relationship is where it gets juicy. <laughs> and there's a lot of iterations of that. There's the first stage of the relationship, which is delicious, but dangerous. There is the comfortable area of the relationship where it becomes more stable and they can grow in other ways and be, you know, perhaps be supportive of each other in that. There's marriage, there's kids, there's just so much. And then that's just the pair of them. There's a whole cast of characters. There's so much potential. I think as long as the writing remains this strong, as long as at least some of the comedy element is retained, I have so much faith in the writing and the characters that there's so much they could do with it, and I just hope they do it. But if not, it was still a great series. I got so much out of it. I'm satisfied and feel like I got a certain amount of closure for what we did see, and I ended the show really loving it. So thank you to everybody who recommended the show. Thank you to everybody who made this so much fun. It's been one of the most just pure fun shows that I've watched on this channel. It's been a great experience. So yeah, thank you again, and I'll see you guys very soon for the start of Violet Evergarden.